All right. Perfect. All right. So um, let's start. So I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today, Sarah Duty. She is the founder and CEO of Career Strategy Lab, a UX designer, researcher, and educator. And you probably have heard her name or have read her posts on LinkedIn, Twitter, or just from the internet. And I personally have always enjoyed reading her tips on building UX portfolio or uh, UX career. So today she will be giving us the talk on how to utilize our product, marketing, and sales knowledge to build a future-proof career. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome Sarah. I'll hand it over to her. Awesome. Thank you. And I am just going to do the trickiest part of tonight, which is sharing my slides. So I have to do this first. And... Continue. All right. I just have to get back to the right slide. Hold on here. You display window. All right, here we are. And now I have to share my screen officially, which share. All right, I think we're in action, right? Let's see. Perfect. Yep. Looks good. Wonderful. Yep. All Right. I am excited to be here. This workshop and talk is pretty new, and it's something that has kind of been marinating, gosh, since probably 2017 or so. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how we or I got to kind of where I am today. But I just want to give everyone kind of a high level overview of where we are headed tonight in case you have to leave in the middle or maybe to coax you to stay. But uh, the first hour of tonight is gonna be a pretty high paced talk um, all about how to design, market and sell the product of you. Um, and then we're going to go into an activity where we are gonna do a little bit of a workshop focusing on, I think, one of the most important elements of the product, product of you, which is crafting your, I call it a compass statement. You could liken that to an elevator pitch for a, a product or something like that. But the reason this compass statement is so important is because it is a block of text, if you will, that you can use in many different places, such as your resume, your portfolio, your LinkedIn, even you know if you're introducing yourself at a conference or an event. So it's really, really valuable. Um, and then we're going to do some Q&A. And if I remember, we're going to do some Q&A kind of at three strategic points in uh, tonight's talk as well. So in case you are new here or we've not met before, um, I'm Sarah. I'm actually originally from Canada. I am from a very small town outside of Ottawa, back in Ontario, but I've been living in the United States for, um, gosh, the past 20 years, which is incredible. Um, and I got into UX in the early 2000s. I worked at a couple of different startups in New York City. Then I quit because I was just burnt out and wanted to do my own thing. And I started doing UX consulting, primarily research and what I would call experience design. So not pixel perfect things for developers, but more user flows, wireframes, et cetera. And then very long story short, in 2017, I kind of started to solve a problem selfishly for myself. And the problem was that my inbox was full of messages from people wanting to know, how do I get hired in UX? How do I make a resume, a portfolio, all of these things. And eventually I was so overwhelmed with my inbox and frankly tired of repeating myself. I made a little class. It was 29 or $39, honestly, um, kind of like a 45 minute lunch and learn, put it up on the internet, it sold out in two days or something. 
I taught it and then people started getting hired. And I guess that's when the researcher in me thought to myself, I might be onto something. So that was five years ago in 2017. Since then, I've kind of gone all in, quote unquote. And now I run something called Career Strategy Lab, which is kind of like a startup incubator, but for your career. Mm -hmm. And whether you're looking for a job now or you just want to be prepared for unexpected opportunities that come your way, um, we can help you with that inside Career Strategy Lab. So we help you with your resume, portfolio, LinkedIn, job search, interviews, and one of the most important things, creating um, what we call a career roadmap, like a product roadmap for your career. So that is a little bit about me. But I'm curious to learn more about all of you. So I'm guessing that you're one of three types of people. And maybe as we get to each slide, just put who you are or use a strategic emoji. We didn't make polls, but that's okay. So if you are a career launcher, I define these people as someone that is setting out to get your first quote real job. Maybe you're just graduated from college or university or you're self-taught and, and you're getting your first professional job. Um, maybe you did a boot camp, maybe you didn't, but you're trying to figure out how the heck do I get hired? So how many launchers do we have? Okay, looks like we have a few here. Um, I wanna move on, but feel free to keep putting your emojis. So next we have career switchers. This is very popular, I would say right now, or common in that I'm seeing a lot of people switching over to user experience from industries like teaching, psychology, journalism, occupational therapy, um, architecture, if I didn't say that already. And so we have all these people who, for whatever reason, are wanting to transfer their skills into UX. And one of the big challenges you face if, if you're a switcher is often trying to communicate how what you did in your previous role translates to user experience. Um, and then next, we have what I call oh, climbers. We skip them, climbers. Um, so you have probably been working in user experience for a while. Um, you're trying to figure out maybe the next chapter in your career, or maybe you've been specializing in something and you want to kind of go more generalist. Maybe you're a generalist and you want to specialize. Um, you're probably one of these three people. So it looks like we have people from all different kind of stages of your career. And what I'm kind of going through right now is really evolved from five years of research. And one of the most interesting insights I found was that no matter what stage you are at, if you have zero years of experience in UX or 15 or more, you've likely faced this problem where you go to Google because you need to type in, how do I um, get ready for a UX interview, a job interview? How do I make a resume? How do I make a portfolio? How do I do this, that, the other? All these things related to your career and your job search. And you go to Google and it's completely overwhelming, right? You end up with 20,000, 50,000 results you have to go through and figure out um, which ones do I trust? And a lot of those results I find are super, super surface level and don't answer your questions. And so what I find is a lot of people, no matter what stage you're at, are trying to figure out how do you identify your career goals, whether it's like very short term or very long term, and actually achieve them, right? There's a difference between having a goal and then actually achieving that goal. A lot of you might be challenged with how do you, like I said about those switchers, package and present your experience in a way that's going to stand out from other candidates and I promise you the bar to stand out is really low and we're gonna to get to that in a little bit, but I think a lot of people overthink the level of detail and dare I say perfectionism that's required to stand out. Um, you also wanna be ready to go into interviews and like I said, be prepared for those unexpected opportunities that might 
come your way. Um, so like I said, I have been running this uh, career strategy lab program. Um, I kind of went all in on that, I don't know, 2017, 2018. I also in 2011 um, created and taught General Assembly's first UX immersive program back was when I was in New York City. I lived there for 13 years. And after that, I really kind of followed this passion for teaching. And it's been really incredible to see the results that people have been able to achieve be through this career strategy lab program. They've been hired at all kinds of companies. I should have put some Canadian ones on here. We've had people get hired um, for TELUS. I don't think that's on there. Um, the government of Alberta um, and some other Canadian companies as well. Um, and on average, people are able to get hired three and a half months after they join, increase their salary by 40% or in dollars is about $26,000. And back to that launcher switcher climber, we're seeing this on average for all of those types of people. So I say that to encourage you to stick around because no matter what career stage you are at, this notion of treating yourself as a product and applying product strategy principles to your career roadmap, to your job search, to your interviews, to your portfolio, et cetera, that is what has helped all these people get these amazing results. All right, so a little pop quiz for you. I'm curious, what do you think this number means? 70,400, any guesses at all? I will wait 10 seconds in the chat to see if anyone types anything in there, but uh, 70,400 hours, interview hours. <laughs> Funny, Sarah. Um, Christopher said lifetime working hours. All right, you guys win if you said lifetime working hours. Now, there's probably various stats around this. I kind of did some rough calculations. If you want to double check my math, there it is. But what does this equate to? It equates to about 30 or 30, one third of your life really working. Um, if you account for sleeping and you know everything else we do in life. That is a lot of time. And I really think that life is too short to be in a role that doesn't challenge you or fulfill you or reflect your skills, your experience, your expertise. And of course, there are times in our lives when we have to get a job because we all have bills. I've been there, taken on freelance projects I wasn't totally passionate about. I get it. But I hope that through what we're going through tonight, you can, you know, when you have the flexibility, be more strategic so you can hopefully get into one of these roles that is going to be more aligned with what you are looking for. So to build a really fulfilling and future-proof career, we need to do what we do with the products that we work on every single day. We need to be really intentional. We need to be doing research, iterating, testing, thinking about our users, for goodness sake. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But when I think about product thinking, I pulled kind of four principles that I think really great product teams, product managers, designers do really well. And let me know if you agree with these. So the first principle that I think is really valuable here is great product thinkers or designers, et cetera. They do things with impulse or intention, not impulse. Goodness, <laughs> I should read my own slides. They do things with intention, not impulse. So an example of this might be, I'm asked really often, um, people say, someone told me my resume needs to be one page. So I made it one page or someone told me this, or I read this on Twitter. So I did it. And people impulsively just follow advice without ever vetting it. And in this example of a one page resume, I think, did you ever stop to think like, well, why do you think it should be one page? Or tell me about like your one page resume and how that has been effective for you. People don't like fact check or do their own thinking. So 
we need to start doing things with more intention and not impulse based on what random strangers tweet or post on the internet or what's viral on TikTok. Um, the second kind of principle that I think is really valuable here is that we make research-based decisions, not reactionary-based decisions. So thinking about your job search, one of the things that has really blown my mind in the last five years is hearing so many stories of people saying that they apply to 100, 200, 300, 400 or more jobs and not had any interviews. And I think to myself, if this were a product, would we keep doing the same thing over and over, getting those results? And I hope the answer is no. So by making research and database decisions, I mean, after applying to 50 jobs or 100 jobs or maybe even 15 jobs and not getting an interview, those would be signals that a product manager would be looking at and realizing maybe there's a problem somewhere. Maybe we should hit pause and try and do some research to figure out where these problems are rather than just like continuing to apply and hit apply on LinkedIn like it's a casino or something. Um, so that's another example of kind of a product thinking, product development principle that I think we could really benefit from applying to our careers. Um, the next principle here is having realistic expectations and not focusing on perfection. And we've all seen companies or maybe worked at companies, I myself did once upon a time, at companies that chased perfection or, and or I guess, kept their product under wraps or in stealth mode for far too long and didn't get it out into the market. And then they launched and guess what? No one wanted it or no one cared. And an example of this might be you try and perfect your resume or your portfolio or you know cover letter, whatever it is. You try and perfect that. And you don't realize that A, maybe you could have got hired with a good enough version, but B, your users, the HR people, the hiring managers, et cetera, they may not have even noticed the difference between what you had for your resume, let's say two weeks ago versus where it is now, because you were obsessing, trying to perfect details that maybe matter to you, but would not even register if you showed someone else like version A and version B. So stop chasing perfection because it's also delaying you getting this in the eyes of recruiters, hiring managers, et cetera. And if you don't start applying, you won't know is your resume portfolio, et cetera, good enough because it very well might be good enough to get hired. Um, so these are four really strategic mindset shifts um, taken from what we do for the products we work on every single day that I think can apply no matter what stage you're at and can help you future-proof your career. And these four principles, let's call them, kind of tie into this whole concept of what I call the product of you. So we're going to go into what the three elements of the product of you are. And uh, the first one is the product. We need a product for the product of you. And as it relates to your career, by product, I mean your skills, your talent, your experience. You could think of those, some of those as the features, right? If we were talking about a real product. And in thinking about this element of product, I want us to think about why do many products fail? Um, I stumbled upon this study from, I forgot what year, 2018, why most products fail. And it's not surprising, right? A lot of them don't have enough money or they've run out of money or they didn't have the right product market fit. Uh, the team, you know, didn't work out, whatever it is. These are not completely, you know, uh, surprising to me. But I think 
most products fail because they did not do research to help them establish, you know, a North Star, this guiding principle for their for their team, um, kind of like writing an essay without a thesis. If you were to do that, it would take you a really long time to get that essay to a point that, you know, it made sense. So a great example of this is a product called Juicero. How many people heard about Juicero out of curiosity? Um, if you didn't hear about it, basically it was kind of like Nespresso when, or Keurig, those coffee machines, but for juice. And you had to buy the machine. And then you also had to buy those packets, which are over at the right. And you put the packets into the machine and the machine would make juice. And the machine costs $700. Also, this company raised millions uh, of dollars, many millions, I forget the exact amount, from places like Google Ventures and all these other really well-known and well-respected um, venture capitalists. Um, but there is one really small problem. First of all, people didn't buy it. That's a problem. So they slashed the price to, I think, $399. But then some reporters from Bloomberg uh, got a hold of this machine and they did a little experiment. And let me see if I can play this. If there is no audio, all it really is, is just kind of like background music. So we won't be missing it much, but I want to, oops, I want to try and play this. So let me hit play. Love that. Hopefully, you guys had a chuckle out of that um, video. And I just want to make sure my microphone is still working. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, yeah. So you didn't need the juice machine. You could just squeeze it with your hands. And to me, that sounds like a massive failure somewhere. And I did not work on Juicero. I don't know anyone that worked there. I have no connection to it whatsoever other than hearing about this years ago and then kind of be in, being enamored with this story and um, following it, there were multiple articles in the New York Times and things like that. And I thought to myself, you know, how do we end up not being like Juicero? How do you avoid making a product that people don't need and don't pay for, right? Slashing your price from 700 to 399 and still having issues and then I don't even know what those juice packets, you know, cost, but it was clearly something no one needed. So how do we avoid making a product that people don't need or won't pay for? Um, we want to, right, make a product that people want, that, the, that they need, that they're going to pay for. A product that you don't need to convince people they need, but that it's so obvious, it's like a no-brainer, right? and a product that's super easy to use and easy to understand. Those are the greatest products. And guess what? We do this, a lot of us, every single day. We follow this product development process and we could call different parts of product development, different things. There's many, you know, sub steps involved here. And I didn't want to make a linear diagram here to kind of avoid getting hung up on the actual process. But in product development, there's things like doing research, creating a roadmap, there's strategy involved, there's feature prioritization, there's designing, developing, building, gathering feedback, et cetera. And when it comes to the product of you, 
we can apply a lot of this to our own careers. So getting really nitty gritty here, if we were to think about on the left column, like what products have versus what you need in your career. So a product has a roadmap, right? And maybe you've worked at a company or currently work at a company that doesn't have a roadmap. It's chaotic. It's not fun. There's a lot of rework. There's a lot of meetings. It takes you forever to get to your goals. Well, in the same way that a product needs a roadmap, your career needs a roadmap for all of those reasons, right? If you don't have an idea of what job you want to have four years from now, you're probably not going to be ready for that job. Um, you're also going to save yourself a lot of time of maybe learning new skills that maybe you don't need. If you have a roadmap, you're going to be more strategic about the skills that you're developing because you can think to yourself, okay, that job that I want to get four years from now, let's say, I know I'm going to need skills one, two, and three. So those are the skills I'm going to focus on right now. Even though I see on Twitter or LinkedIn, everyone says I need to know this software or what have you. So we're going to talk about career roadmaps in a little bit, but products also have a strategy, right? There's product strategy. It helps kind of connect the dots between this vision and how do we actually turn that into a reality. And the same thing for your career. It's great to have a roadmap with an idea of where you want to go, but if you don't take that destination and kind of break it down into tangible action steps of, okay, I know I want to learn these skills. Okay. I can't learn all three at once. So I'm going to prioritize those skills that I want to learn in a certain order. That makes logical sense, right? Um, products have features, right? Um, like, I don't know, filters in a shopping app or something like that. We all know what features are. When it comes to your career and you, your features are the skills that you have, the software you know, the methods you know. It could also involve the experience you have in different industries, right? The different kind of domain knowledge that you have. And products also have feedback loops, right? We have feedback loops that are, are happening with software, and we're also having feedback through research, et cetera. And in the same thing with our career, we need feedback loops. We need to be constantly testing, iterating, gathering information from um, how our interviews go, um, conversations with our manager, boss, colleagues, et cetera. Um, and if we don't have those things, then it's really easy to get stagnant and also, it can be very easy to kind of not realize how talented maybe we are because there's kind of this phenomenon, there's probably a word for this phenomenon that I'm not aware of, but the idea that sometimes you might be really great at something, but it might not be obvious to you. But if you were to ask other people, they'd say, no way, you are amazing at, you know, fill in the blank. So you won't know that if you don't have these feedback loops. So when you treat your career like a product, you are going to have a lot of benefits. You're going to have the skills you need to do the job either now or in the future. You're going to have like a lot of the soft skills that you need as well. You're going to have a vision and values that really guide you. So you're not being pulled in too many directions and thinking to yourself, well, you know, John tweeted on Twitter that I need to learn to code. So I guess I better that add that to the list too, right? Um, you might go back to your career roadmap and think, well, actually, I don't need to learn to code because that has nothing to do with my short or long-term roadmap for my career. Um, when you treat your career like a product, you're going to have kind of a system to measure your own performance and not just be relying on performance reviews that maybe your boss or company does. And I think most importantly, you're going to know the skills to focus on so that, like I said, you don't get distracted with skills that don't matter to you right now. And this one's really important because a lot of people focus on kind of trendy skills but it's very important to think about the timeless 
skills that are going to help you and still be relevant 10 years from now. Because we've all seen products do that thing where they, you know, copy each other in terms of features and things. And then, oh, all of a sudden they realize it doesn't make sense. And so they rip that out of the product. And then you think, oh, they wasted all that time building that. Like, look at, um, I don't even know what it's called, like stories, for example. Okay, Instagram had stories. Facebook, I think they have stories maybe. Twitter had stories and they took it out. LinkedIn, who the heck knows? And think of all the time that all those teams spent like copying each other, doing the trendy thing. And then, oh, no one used it, right? So you don't want to be like them spending time doing things or learning things that, you know, two weeks or two years from now, you realize, oh, that was a waste of time. <laughs> so um, when you are clear about this product element, you are going to be more confident in your skills and experience. And as a result of that, your manager, your colleagues, recruiters, any all these people are going to really see your value. Um, you are not going to be overwhelmed with a to-do list that's like 20 items long in terms of professional development. And your job search is going to feel really, dare I say, effortless because you have the clarity of where you want to be in the future. And I think some of the other benefits or things you'll avoid are being stagnant with your skills, um, being stagnant even with your salary. Um, you're not going to feel trapped in your job. And like I said, you're not going to waste time trying to learn everything. Um, and I'm a super visual person. I have a lot of little diagrams that I've made up over the years. But when you are really clear with the product element of you, your skills and growth like nicely improve over time with very little detours, right? Instead of looking like this, which I think a lot of people might feel like their career path has been. But the difference is that the person that is over at the right had that roadmap. They had that vision. They had a clear compass or thesis to guide them, which allowed them to have really clear goals and really, really clear priorities. Um, and I just pulled a few little kind of screenshots from different people regarding the idea of having a roadmap and compass statement for their career. And this guy said the compass statement, which we're going to write in the workshop, was a sleeper hit. It helped me focus on my search and made it so easy for me to write and talk about my values and goals. And if you don't have an idea of the job you want next or what you want to do and what your true skills and experience are, then it makes it really, really hard to write your resume or decide what projects should go into your portfolio or not, or what you should put on your LinkedIn or what jobs you should even apply to. So this idea of treating your career like a product, establishing a roadmap for your career is really, really important. Um, we may have covered a few of these, but I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss anything. Yeah, the roadmap really kind of serves as a filter. So it can help you make decisions like what skills should I focus on this quarter? What maybe conferences or events should I attend? What projects should I put in my portfolio? Even things like what company should I consider working at? Does this company align with the skills and experience that I want to acquire given my career roadmap where I wanna be in the future? Um, and as a result of having this roadmap, you're gonna have more time to focus on the two next things that are really, really important to this idea of the product of you. So to recap really quickly, this product element in our little Venn diagram, this is going to involve having a really clear career roadmap, having a compass statement or this elevator pitch of you, you could also call it, identifying your short and long-term goals, having kind of feedback loops and regular check-ins, 
understanding your customers or users. So it might be recruiters, hiring managers, people involved in interviews, et cetera. And having prioritized skills to develop so you don't feel like kind of an octopus, uh, for lack of a better analogy, trying to do all of the things and become that proverbial unicorn. Because in my opinion, this whole unicorn thing doesn't really exist. So I'm really curious in the chat, if any of you have something that maybe don't call it a roadmap, or if you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, I need to make a roadmap like tonight or tomorrow. Um, so let me know in the chat, do you have a roadmap for your career? Um, if you do have some type of roadmap or vision, do you maybe need to revisit it? Maybe it was something you did two years ago and you think, oh, it's maybe I should update that, right? Um, now that you're thinking about yourself as a product and thinking about your skills really being like features of a product, maybe you need to do a little audit of your quote features and think about what features do I have right now? Should I keep developing those? Or based on where I wanna be in the future, maybe I need to let some of those features go to make room for learning new features. Um, and then another thing to think about is, have you encountered any challenges in your career so far that after hearing this idea of the product of you, um, you realize, huh, maybe that wouldn't have happened if I'd had a clear roadmap for my career. So you're going to get um, these slides, I believe. So feel free to go back to these reflection slides. But I want to move on in the interest of time. So the second part of the product of you is the idea of marketing, right? We can have a great product, but if there's no marketing, that's going to be a problem because people won't know about you. They won't like you and they won't trust you. Not that we need everyone to like us, but going back to the idea of why do most products fail? I would say another thing is um, without marketing, how will people even know about your product, right? Because you can't just have a product, you have to let people know it exists so then they can decide if they're going to buy it. And I would argue another really important addition or edit we can make to this sentence is without marketing, how will the right people know about your product? Because we don't want to spend money on marketing to the wrong people, right? Because that's going to just be wasted marketing money. So I want to look at this idea of how do we get ourselves in front of the right people to let them know about you and your career and your skills and experience and why they might be interested in talking to you, having a conversation about maybe if you could work with them now or in the future. So there's kind of strategic and not very strategic marketing. And I'm really curious, you're probably wondering what the heck is this slide about? But um, have you ever been driving down the road and seen the sign spinners that's, that stand there in all types of weather and do this? And it's normally for mattresses or like sandwiches, I find. <laughs> and my stance here is like, A, it's amazing that companies do this, but B, I don't think this is very strategic marketing because to me, it is the wrong people, it is the wrong time, and it's the wrong place. Like you're driving in a car. How are you going to remember to, you know, the name of that company or the phone number or whatever? If you're in your car, you're probably on your way somewhere. So it's definitely the wrong time. And sometimes, like, they're in very obscure places, such as this random guy. Um, now, a more strategic method of marketing might be, and excuse my Photoshop skills here, but a more strategic marketing activity might be for like Sam the sign spinner to go over to the joint chiropractic and stand in that parking lot. <laughs> to me, that's a lot more strategic because what's happening now? He is getting in front of the right people. He's probably 
closer to being at the right time and he's in the right place, right? If you're on your way to the chiropractor, maybe you might also be convinced you need a new mattress. So I know this is a little bit cheesy, but I really wanna make the point that when it comes to marketing, we have to think about being in front of the right people with the right message. So we really need to focus on this to let people know how you are different and better than the competition. And maybe some of you are experienced in marketing, maybe you are not, but a quick 10 second marketing uh, crash class, I would say, uh, masterclass. So I think some of the important goals when it comes to thinking about marketing, the product of you, it's really about letting people know your product exists, having people trust your product, Having people see how your product or you would add value to their company, um, help people understand why the product or you is better than the competition, aka other candidates, and very important, how people can easily find your product. So with the right marketing, you can create an awesome first impression and opportunities are gonna come your way, such as if you optimize your LinkedIn profile, um, you can end up seeing more people like organically messaging you with roles that actually align with what you're looking for because now your LinkedIn profile is communicating very clearly what you do, what is your differentiator and what you are looking for and so you're going to attract more of those opportunities um, rather than having random jobs come across your inbox that you think, I have no experience in that. Why is that recruiter asking me um, to do that or to apply to that job? So thinking about marketing and our career, um, I want to think about sustainability, really, because a lot of people get burnt out in their job search or I hear a lot of chatter about like developing a personal brand and all this stuff. And I think it's really unsustainable to be applying to hundreds and hundreds of roles, going to networking events all the time, like having a packed calendar of meetups and things like that. Going back to personal brand, like feeling pressure to be constantly posting on LinkedIn and Twitter and all these places to try and get seen and everything. Um, even just with online communities, they're great, but I think there's also kind of community fatigue where how engaged can you really be if you're in five different UX communities and each of them has like 10,000 people? It just seems exhausting to me. So instead of trying to constantly spend time and energy, like putting yourself out there, marketing yourself for lack of a better word, what would happen if we could have a really strategic system kind of working in the background, almost on autopilot, that would always be marketing kind of the product of you. And that's kind of what can happen when you have some of these things in place. So this is meant to represent like all of the possible career assets, I call them, or career materials that could impact the first impression that someone has about you. So I think of a cover letter, initial emails, portfolio, social media posts, LinkedIn, resume, personal website, if you have them, have one, because one of the really important things to remember is that you can't control which of these things someone is going to go to first, right? A lot of people kind of put a lot of emphasis on, say, the portfolio, and then they neglect their resume or their LinkedIn or other things, but you don't know if they're going to go to your portfolio first. What if they go to your LinkedIn first and you spent like 10 minutes on your LinkedIn and it's barely filled out or full of spelling mistakes? So it's important as you're thinking about how are you marketing the product of you to think about all the places where you could make a first impression and that you have to give all of these things equal attention because you don't know which one someone's going to look at first. And most people's career assets fall short because I've been doing this for five years and I've seen now thousands of resumes and portfolios. And the one thing I know for sure 
is that a lot of people don't articulate their true skill and experience and they sell themselves short. And they do this because you just show the tip of the iceberg of your skills and experience and you just say what you did and you show a screenshot of that nice homepage or something and you don't show everything below the tip of the iceberg. And that is what hiring managers want to see. They want to not just see what you did, but why you did it, how you did it, what happened. So I want to go back to this first impression slide and really zoom into resume for a moment to give you some really tangible ideas of this kind of iceberg, iceberg graphic in action. So imagine there a recruiter is looking at your resume and this is a user researcher resume and it says responsible for conducting usability tests, facilitated a research, research workshop for the product and marketing teams and we're not going to read the rest of them. But let's just look at this top bullet point. It says responsible for conducting usability tests. Okay, that's like the tip of the iceberg. It's only telling people what you did. And there's a heck of a lot more you did than just conducting uh, usability tests. Because what you actually did below the tip of the iceberg, that's missing. So what might that have been? Well, if we were to rewrite that to address questions of like, what type of research did you do? How many people did you talk to, et cetera? It might become, I reduced e-commerce checkout abandonment by 15% with usability testing alongside the design team. Conducted 20 hours of remote moderated usability tests for three different checkout prototypes. Can you see the difference between that and the top of the iceberg where the person had just written responsible for conducting usability tests? Like the difference is so dramatic. And I can't emphasize this enough that the bar to stand out is so low because so many people literally just put responsible for creating wireframes, responsible for conducting usability tests, responsible for this, that, the other. And it's so repetitive. It's so boring. And that second bullet point that I just read, it tells the scope, the depth of the research, the element of collaborating with a design team that it had to do with um, testing checkout prototypes. So when you're writing your resume bullet points, think about not just what you did, but the impact, the how, and the who, the what, in this case, 20 hours of research, um, and the other what, which was testing three different checkout prototypes. So another quick example might be LinkedIn. Um, your LinkedIn profile, I pulled this at random. I don't know this person. Their profile was public. So just want to caveat that. But um, your LinkedIn headline is so, so important. Their headline says senior product designer at Slack. That headline can impact where you show up in search results. It can also contribute to the first impression people have about you because that headline shows up other places, like over in the right sidebar. Even when you comment on things in posts, it has your headline underneath. And a lot of the headlines I see on LinkedIn are not very good. These are real headlines that I found um, on LinkedIn, but I use John Smith so as to not embarrass anyone. But like a headline such as innovation, innovation oriented guy with a twisted and resilient mindset. A, like, what does that even mean? B, no recruiter or hiring manager is sitting there typing into the LinkedIn search, like where they search for candidates. No one's type, typing in innovation oriented guy or innovation oriented UX designer or UX designer with resilient mindset. Like the chances of that are pretty darn low. So I really want you to think about how maybe you could optimize your headline, because if you can have an optimized headline, then you're going to show up in, in um, search results more. And that's what I mean when I say kind of marketing yourself on autopilot, because if you take the time to optimize that headline, 
you're going to show up more in search. And I know this because people in my career strategy lab program say this all the time. Like as soon as I went through the LinkedIn module, I was able to have more people reaching out to me for roles that actually related to what I do. So I think you get the idea of how to improve those headlines. You want to use terminology that people might be using to search for candidates like you. You don't want to be too vague. You don't want to be too like cute or innovative either. Um, but this only all works if that message and story about who you are and what you do is really consistent and clear. So in talking with a lot of recruiters and hiring managers, some of the kind of pet peeves and suggestions that they have is that they want you to have a consistent story across all of your career assets. Because if you say you do one thing on your LinkedIn and something else in your portfolio or your resume, it gives them a really confusing message of, okay, what do you actually do? Um, so through having a really consistent and compelling story about you as a product and your features and your skills and experience, um, you are going to stand out from all those people that are super vague. Um, you are going to be able to um, appear in search results, for example, and bonus, you are going to feel a lot more confident on those initial phone screens for interviews or even in interviews. Because when people say like, tell me about yourself, you could kind of default to this compass statement that we're going to write towards the end of um, today when we get into the workshop. Um, so I want us to keep a few things in mind about marketing in that you shouldn't be redoing your resume and your portfolio over and over and over, because if you do it really well once, it should be able to live for years to come, of course, with some little updates. But if you invest the time now, it's going to pay back for years to come. And the other thing to remember is stop trying to perfect these things. Because like I said, the bar to stand out is low. If you can just rewrite your resume bullet points so that they don't just focus on, I created wireframes or I did user research and went just a level deeper, that is going to stand out big time. Um, the other thing to think about is that personalizing your marketing materials, meaning your resume, your portfolio and cover letter, for example, I would argue that is not optional because in the same way that we try and create a personalized or customized experience for our users, or let's face it, when you're scrolling Instagram or other places, why do you end up buying things that you see in those ads? Because it's personalized to you. <laughs> And so if you can personalize your resume, cover letter, portfolio to the roles that you are applying to, that is going to help you stand out immensely. Um, if not, then maybe you're going to end up getting passed over for those interviews. So I'm really curious um, if you're thinking to yourself, okay, maybe I spent too much time on my resume and not enough on my portfolio, or maybe vice versa, or maybe you didn't even realize you could go and customize that LinkedIn headline, because if you don't customize it, it just defaults to your current job title and company. Um, or are you thinking to yourself, huh, maybe I need to be a little bit more strategic so that I can be maybe appearing in search results just by making some of these changes to my LinkedIn, or maybe you've been applying to jobs and using the same resume and the same portfolio and the same cover letters, and you haven't got interviews. If so, maybe it's time you do a little bit of customization to each of those next time you apply to a job. Um, so you can go through these reflection questions on your own, because I want to get to the next step element of the product of you, which is 
sales, right? You can have a great product, you can have great marketing, but if you don't have like a sales team or sales strategies, you're never going to ultimately kind of close the deal for lack of better words. So if marketing is all about getting noticed, getting people aware of your product, sales is about getting hired. And not everyone here is probably experienced with sales. And I don't want you to be intimidated by sales. I'm not going to turn you into a salesperson, but I want to just give you some uh, ideas of how to apply really basic sales principles to your job search and to your interviews. So there's this fairly common kind of model of sales, the AIDA sales model. And starting at the top, sales is all about getting attention, then getting someone interested in your product or service, then making someone desire or want your product or service. And then they desire or want it so much that they actually take action and they, you know, buy it. Or in your case, hire you. So as it relates to, you know, becoming a customer, for example, the customer starts at the top, they're in, they, you get their attention and then they move through that to become an actual customer and applying to your career. How does a UX manager end up hiring you? Same thing. You as the candidate catch their attention. And the goal is that after you catch their attention, they're interested, they want to learn more, they have a conversation, they do email, whatever with you, then they really desire you and they think, wow, we need this person on our team. And then they take action to actually give you a job offer. That's the ultimate goal here, right? And so the issue is that most candidates, and maybe if this is you, hopefully you're not going to make this mistake again, but most candidates apply to jobs and then like cross their fingers, hope for the best and kind of file the emails in a folder and don't do anything beyond applying, right? And this is exactly how to not get hired. It's not something that we should be leaving to chance. We should do more than just click apply. And the other thing I want to make really clear is that we need to stop playing the numbers game in the job search. You shouldn't be gambling with your career and just continuing to hope that eventually the odds will be in your favor. And instead, the alternative here is that we want to nurture the applications we are going to submit. So we might actually end up applying to less jobs, but we're going to apply to more of the right jobs and we're going to nurture them. And we'll talk about what nurturing means in a little bit. But for every job you apply to, nurturing really means that you would be trying to find the hiring manager to follow up and let them know that you applied to that job, maybe even multiple times so that you increase your chances of standing out to them. And if you haven't applied yet, but you know that you might want to work at certain companies, I would really encourage you to start forming relationships with people at those companies now, or at minimum, go and follow people who work at some of those companies so that number one, you could maybe see if they post that they are hiring, but number two, so that maybe you will spark relationships with them. And then if you do apply, you would say to them, hey, I applied to whatever job at your company, and you never know where those little connections might lead. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, oh, that feels uncomfortable. I don't want to cold email people, et cetera. So I see posts like this all the time where hiring managers give examples of stories when they were hiring and someone cold emailed them and guess what? They ended up getting hired. So this person, Adam, who is a hiring manager at a company, I'm not going to read this all to you, but basically he says, I hired a candidate that first connected through LinkedIn. Um before they were even like uh, put through the applicant tracking system, 
the candidate went and applied or sent the hiring manager a message which said, hi, Adam, I hope you're well. I wanted to connect to learn more about the program manager roles you're hiring for. I'm currently a you know job title at company with however many years of experience, looking for a new opportunity and open to the option of relocation. Hope to speak with you soon. Thanks, right? And he said, Adam said, there's no perfect intro. It depends on the audience. You have to tailor it to the person. But that example is very conce concise very clear, very direct, and not just like, hey, how are you? Or can you like pull some strings and help me get hired? So I want to break, um, let's see. The other thing to remember, Adam, the hiring manager said, uh, I often get upwards of 25 to 30 messages a week. I appreciate that I didn't have to read multiple paragraphs because also as someone who gets a lot of messages, guess what messages I don't pay attention to? The ones that are like, more than five paragraphs long, so I don't have time. So this is a great example of a, com a candidate cold emailing a hiring manager, understanding the user, aka the hiring manager, thinking of their needs, which is short and concise, and going into that cold email with a really strategic message. These are articulating not just, hey, Adam, can I learn more about the job? But, oh, and by the way, I'm also currently a program manager at whatever company with 10 years of experience, that's going to stand out. So think about that and use that as an example if you're going to cold email people. But chances are either you or your friends, colleagues have been in this situation in the past where you have applied to hundreds of jobs and it's taken you months or years to get hired. I say this because I hear this week after week from people that message me or come into Career Strategy Lab, but by being really strategic and developing authentic relationships, you can end up applying to far less jobs and reduce that time to getting hired from weeks or months, or sorry, months or years to weeks. And I think it's really important to keep in mind, this can all happen though, if you, kind of do what we just went through. Think about treating yourself like a product, knowing your product, knowing its features, knowing how to articulate those features, having solid career materials that you're customizing, and then leveraging relationships to help you as you try and go into the quote sales part and ultimately get hired. So reducing the time to find roles and get hired I think is directly related to the quality of relationships that you invest in in your job search or in your career. Because I think a lot of us are kind of enamored with the quantity of connections. And let's face it, LinkedIn is kind of gamified to make you think, oh, if I just get to 500 connections and it's like gonna unlock this magical world or something. But it's not about quantity. It's about the quality of relationships because what good is it to have a thousand connections on LinkedIn if no one knows anything about you? And if you were to cold email any of those people, they wouldn't maybe even recognize your face, your name, or know anything about you. If you have a hundred connections and you've actually like exchanged DMs or emails, or maybe had phone calls with some of those people, those people are more likely to reply to your email or do you a favor or something like that. So think about quality over quantity of relationships, uh, professional relationships in your career. So when it comes to sales and relationships, think about what could you do, you know, in your current or future job search to try and nurture those applications. And remember that nurture was about like reaching out, cold emailing people, trying to find people at those companies where you applied or may apply in the future. Um, maybe you have too much focus on building a giant network. Maybe you're realizing, huh, maybe it is better to have a smaller network, but actually go a little deep with those people. And then, after every single interview, not just after you apply, 
But after every single interview, I would encourage you to be following up, sending thank yous, also following up with questions too. Questions are a great way to keep the conversation going. So instead of just saying, thanks for interviewing me. I hope you have a good weekend. Like, thanks for interviewing. And by the way, I remember you asked me about this, that, the other, I thought of this time I worked on this project and, you know, fill in the blank. Those are all examples of this element of nurturing. So those are the three elements of the product of you, the product, your skills, talent, experience, the marketing, how people know about you, trust you, want to learn more about you. And then the sales element, right? How do you stand out, get hired? It's all about relationships. And I promise you, after teaching so many people all of this, the details of this in Career Strategy Lab, I wish that every person could, you know, watch this and learn these principles because I think it makes your current and every job search in the future a lot easier and gives you things to think about that you could be doing in between those periods when you're just happily employed, but activities that could be really beneficial next time maybe you, you know, are looking for opportunities such as building authentic relationships or making sure you're regularly updating your marketing materials, in this case, your resume, portfolio, et cetera, so that you don't have to rush to do it if someone says, hey, I have this opportunity for you. You know, can you interview next week? And you think, oh gosh, it's going to take me a month to update everything. If you're updating that all the time, it's not going to take you as long. So I'm super, super curious before we get into the workshop part, um, what was your biggest takeaway from this concept of treating your career as a product. And one thing I really like to do is imagine, I don't have stickies with me, but imagine you have only a post-it note. What would you write on that post-it note? And maybe for those of you that like a challenge, like one of the mini post-it notes, what would you write as your biggest takeaway? And maybe it's focus on less on perfection, or Olivia said, figure out my career roadmap. Maybe it's not play the numbers game. Maybe it's quality over quantity of relationships. Okay, Jay, I just read your mind. There you go, right? Um, nurturing, cold emailing people, not being afraid to do those things. Sarah said, not having a clear destination and not considering my target market. Exactly. Not considering your users too, right? In that example of the cold email that someone sent Adam, he really pointed out like, this person stood out because they understood me. It wasn't 10 paragraphs, my whole life story. And ever since I was a little kid, I you know, liked problems or something. It was like, you're hiring for this. I do this. I've been doing it in this industry for 10 years. Amazing. Um, EB said, put my product into the market faster. I love that one because if you keep trying to spend another two months perfecting your resume or portfolio, guess what? That's two months you're not applying. And maybe if you had applied two months earlier, you would have got hired, but you won't know that unless you put yourself out there. Um, and if you got hired two months sooner, that's probably a bigger salary for two extra months. So it's like this compounding or domino effect uh, that can happen if you choose to stay in perfection. Um, okay, Gina said, personalizing my LinkedIn headline and following up. Okay, awesome. That super strategic. I hear from people all the time after I updated my LinkedIn profile and the about section, like people started reaching out to them. Um, so I know that was a ton of information. Uh, I'm glad to see some of you have some really great takeaways. And it sounds like ideas of things you want to focus on. So I want to move into our workshop element here where I said we are going to write this compass statement, elevator pitch, whatever you want to call it. I have a Google Doc I'm going to share in the chat in just a little bit, and we're going to move into breakout rooms for some of this. But um, what I want to do first is uh, give you kind of a walkthrough of this compass statement thing. So 
But to effectively communicate all of this, we need a compass statement. And like I said, it's like an elevator pitch. It's being able to quickly explain to people who you are, what you do, why you're different, so that they can have a very clear and concise kind of first impression about you. And you're not just going to sound like every other UX person who says like, I'm passionate about design and want to use it to change the world. So where would you use this compass statement? You can imagine the compass statement and we will see examples in a moment, um, like a couple of small paragraphs. Now, each of those paragraphs is like little Lego blocks and you might use sometimes one sentence at the top of your resume, three sentences on your cover letter, the full compass statement in the about section of your LinkedIn. You might put bits and pieces of your compass statement on the headline of your LinkedIn, on your website or portfolio. You might include bits of it in cold emails to people. Or like I said, when you're meeting people in person or like in communities and stuff. So at a super high level, the goal of a compass statement is to help people understand what do you do? What makes you uniquely qualified to do that thing? What unique experience or differentiators do you have? And this is really important. What are you looking for in your next career move or the next little milestone or uh, what do you call that thing when you're driving in a car rest stop <laughs> on your um, roadmap? That wasn't the greatest analogy, but let's go through an example compass statement. Then we're going to go through where someone might use bits and pieces of this. And then you are going to write your own and it's going to be a lot easier than you think. So let me read this one as an example. I'm Melody a user researcher with five years of experience doing qualitative and quantitative research for news and health companies. Previously, I was a journalist for eight years, during which I pitched, researched, and produced multimedia stories for companies, including Fast Company and Vox. My experience as a journalist has been integral to how I extract stories from my research participants and how I use storytelling to help communicate the insights in a meaningful way to stakeholders and team members. I'm looking for a full-time remote role on an established product team with the goal of moving into leadership or management. Now, if you were, you know, meeting someone at an event, you wouldn't like rattle that off verbatim. So, you know, take this with a little bit of salt here. But the point is that when you can get this compass statement really dialed in, you can just pull bits and pieces of it and use it in different situations. So this might be a LinkedIn headline, you know, someone or in your about section of LinkedIn, this is maybe a little too long for a headline, but maybe it's the start of your about section or at the top of your resume. Maybe you have two of the sentences that could easily live at the top of the resume. And then maybe in the about section of your LinkedIn profile, or maybe um, in the kind of about me section of your portfolio, um, you might use the entire compass statement. I'm hoping that my highlighting is showing up there, but on this slide, the entire compass statement is highlighted. And then on this previous slide, just the top two sections, two sentences, of the compass statement are highlighted as things that you could use on your um, resume. So what we're going to do here is uh, we are going to go into a Google Doc, which I created for you. And I think it's going to make sense for all of us to stay in the same room and maybe not use breakout rooms just yet. And maybe if we have time and if there's enough people, it might make sense to go to breakout rooms and share our compass statements with each other and think to ourselves, does this achieve kind of all the goals that a compass statement has? So in the chat, I'm putting a link to a Google doc. When you click that link, it's going to give you the option 
to make a copy of the document. So just click that and it's going to bring up a, a Google page and just hit the like, I think it's a blue, make a copy, um, copy button. And then I am going to pause my screen share and go into the actual Google Doc so that we can all be looking at it together. So I need to go here um, and share, whoops, share that screen and make that smaller. Okay. Um, so now you can all see my Google Doc. Hopefully you all have the compass statement. And I want us to do this kind of Mad Libs style. Now, don't, don't freak out and try and do this perfectly. You can go back and do this tomorrow, Saturday, et cetera. But try and treat this as like your MVP, your minimum viable compass statement. So MVCS, minimum viable compass statement. <laughs> um, let's put write your minimum viable MV career compass statement, whatever. We'll get the right acronym eventually. But just to recap, because you can all see my screen or you're looking at the document, um, we want this compass statement to explain what do you do, what makes you qualified to do this, what unique experience or differentiators do you have, and what you're looking for in your next career move. So if we click on number one, what do you do? That's gonna jump us down to the next page. So page two of the Google Doc. And there's a couple of little quick activities we can do to come up with the answer to what do you do? Because a lot of people say, oh, I'm a user researcher. I'm a UX designer. I'm a this, I'm a that. And it kind of all sounds the same. So in this example, someone might say, I'm a UX designer. And if I was meeting you in real life, I would say like, oh, well, like, tell me what you actually do. Like, do you also code or do you also do research or do you do visual design or just experience design? Like, what do you mean by UX designer? And so that person might say, okay, well, I don't code. I'm more of a researcher and I do design things but I mainly focus on kind of process, user flows, experience, but I don't do pixel perfect, like make it pretty design. So can you see how it can be easy to fall into the trap of just saying, oh, I do, I'm a UX designer or I'm a researcher, but when prompted to go a little deeper, you could probably get a little bit more specific. So the first thing we want to do, just so we can get it down on paper, in step number one, where it says, what's your title? Just put whatever you do. If it says UX designer, that's fine. Because step two, we're going to go a little bit deeper. So maybe you're putting your title as UX designer, content strategist, UX writer, whatever it is. Um, feel free to put that in the chat too, so we can make this interactive. And so I know you're actually doing this. <laughs> but what's your title? Um, and then we're going to move on to step two to extract that detail so we can understand what do you mean by UX designer? So most importantly, put it in the Google Doc. And then if you have time, put your answer to what's your title or what would you call yourself in the chat? So we have someone that put UI UX designer, visual designer, aspiring UX designer. Okay. Okay. I am not a fan of when people say aspiring UX designer, because that automatically lets people know that you are less experienced or that you're still learning, et cetera. And I would rather you just put UX designer and kind of own it and let them figure out on their own where you are in your career journey. So for people who are starting out, what I'm trying to say is I'm not a fan of emphasizing what could be perceived as uh weakness is the wrong word, but don't shine a spotlight on things that might be a yellow flag for someone. On the flip side, if you have 10 years of experience, then definitely put, you know, UX designer with 10 years of experience or something. Um, okay. Product designer, service designer. Okay. I'm going to keep going. Now in section two, it says, now let's get specific. What do you do 
And what do you not do? So I'm not going to go through examples for every single like job title here, but think about what do you do versus what do you not do? So what are some assumptions that people might make if you said, I'm a UX designer? In that example at the top, one of the assumptions that someone might have made was, oh, well, you're a UX designer. So do you do code or do you do research or do you UX writing? So to make it really easy for you in this two column, um, two column uh, part of the Google Doc brainstorm, what do you do, but what do you not do? I'm going to give you maybe two minutes to do that. Um, and again, we're focusing on the minimum version here. So you can go back and do this on your own on the weekend or find other people who are here tonight and, you know, pair up and do it together, do a V2 here. Um, but that is what is going to help you get to that next level of what do you actually, actually do? And it looks like we need the link to the Google Doc again for a couple of you. So I'm going to drop that in the chat again. Um, you may need to be signed in to Google because it's going to give you the option to like copy that Google Doc and you have to click make a copy. Um, and then it's going to make a copy and put the word copy next to the kind of title of the Google Doc or just follow along with what you're seeing on the screen here. Um, okay, so who has had a chance to put in what do you do versus not do? This is gonna be hard to put into the chat. So maybe we won't do this part in the chat, but I want us to come up with what your quote, what I do phrase is. So thinking back to that original example, the person, I'm highlighting in my Google Doc here, but the person says, I'm a UX designer. That's what they originally said. Um, their statement, their improved statement might be, I'm a user researcher and experience designer. Because remember, back in the example, the person said, okay, I don't code and I don't do visual design. I don't do pixel perfect things. So instead of just calling myself a UX designer, I'm going to be specific and say, I'm a user researcher and experienced designer. That's a lot clearer than saying I'm a UX designer or I'm a product designer because UX designer, product designer means different things at different companies. And I think it's totally okay if we change what we call ourselves, your job, your company might give you one title, but on your LinkedIn, it could be a lot clearer to say, in this case, I'm a user researcher and experienced designer, instead of just saying, I'm an experienced designer. So for those of you that um, in the chat earlier, put in your title, so, Annie said product designer, Chrissy said service designer, uh, Hannah said UX designer, Sarah said visual designer. I'm not gonna go through everyone. Think of what your new, what I do phrase could be. So I'm gonna wait and see in the chat here what you might come up with. And in step three, there are some examples and I'll read some of them. So maybe you are an experienced and visual interface designer. Maybe you realize UX designer who focuses on interface and visual design, product manager focused on business to consumer health products, UX writer and content strategist. Maybe you're an interface designer and front end developer, or maybe a UX designer who focuses on early stage products. Those are all examples of what I mean by this, what I do phrase. So anyone have an example they want to share in the chat? I would love to see them. Um, I'm gonna hang out and see. Okay, so Daniel says, I'm a product manager and experienced project manager with four years of experience. Great, very specific. 
that's a lot better than just, I'm a product manager, right? Um, your product and project and four years of experience. Without adding that four years of experience, it would leave me to wonder, do you have one experience, zero experience, 10? I don't know. So that is a great example of really leveraging your um, years of experience. Okay, who else want to share? I love it, Daniel. Okay, Hannah said, I'm an ex user experience designer focused on information architecture, ideate, and concept. Okay, I like where this is headed and I wanna give you a quick tip. I think I like, I'm a user experience designer focused on information architecture. I wonder if ideate and concept um, if we could come up with a different way to say that, because think about that. If no recruiters and hiring managers are probably not searching for phrases such as ideate or concept, user experience designer, yes. Information, information architecture, yes. So maybe think to yourself, what do you really mean by ideate and concept? Are you more focused on the visual design side of things. Do you do research? I don't know, but that's what I mean by thinking about the, um, the user and how this might, you know, in the case of LinkedIn, impact where you might show up. Cause I don't think people would be putting words like ideate and concept in when they're searching for candidates, because they often are searching by job title, responsibility, et cetera. Um, okay, Sarah said, I'm a visual and experienced designer in B2B product marketing. I love it. Really clear. We understand what products you have experience in and what you focus on. Robert said, I'm a product designer who facilitates collaboration between engineering and product teams. Super clear, great. Um, Mary said, I'm a generalist user experience designer with one year of experience. Great. I, um, I am wondering if we even need generalist user experience designer. Um, A, I'm not sure if people search for like uh, generalist user experience designer. So in the spirit of keeping this short and sweet, I think you would really get rid of user experience designer. And I think it's fine to have one year of experience. Now, here's something you could add to it. What do you have experience in? Do you have experience in certain types of products, industries, maybe apps or web apps or enterprise products or SaaS products, or I don't know what, <laughs> um, VR, I don't know. So that's kind of another, like, let's peel back the layers of the onion, but great start, Mary. Okay. Um, Jeff said, um, I'm a project management expert and consultant certified by worldwide professional organizations, including ISO, PMI, APMG, IPMA, registered as ISO, TC258 expert, more than 15 years of experience as project program manager with extensive technology, and leadership experiences in Fortune 500 corporations. Okay, that you have a lot of experience and that's great. And I think that in the next couple of sections here, you're gonna be able to use that for some of the other parts of this. So don't delete anything, but you might kind of be a few steps ahead of us, but I love the level of detail. The one thing is, I'm not sure if you need all of those um, professional organizations, et cetera. I admittedly am not well-versed in these. So I don't know if people who hire people like you would be searching for like project manager with certification in ISO TC 2.5 or 258 expert. But um, think about that when you think of if someone were hiring someone like me, what might they be putting into the search? So Think about that, but don't delete anything because you might be able to reuse it in the next sections. Okay, Mary said, I'm user experience designer with an educational background in architecture and one year of experience in mobile app design. Great. See, we wouldn't have known that you have experience in architecture from that other version. 
Okay, great job. Let's keep going. I love how participatory you guys are. <laughs> so let's move on. Step two, um, what makes you qualified and unique? So some of you already included this, but for those of you that didn't, or for those of you that did, you might think of more you could add. So we're going to brainstorm out what experience do you have, maybe years of experience, prior experience, like Mary's experience in architecture. Do you have any degrees or experiences that are relevant? Now let's, sorry, degrees or certificates. Small caveat here. I don't care about the certificate that took you 20 minutes to do like on Udemy or something. To me, many certificates, let me rephrase that. Not all certificates are created equal because anyone on the internet can make a course and make a certificate in Photoshop or Canva and give it to you. So be mindful of listing every random certificate you've ever acquired, but do shine a spotlight on and brag about really awesome credentials that you might have. If you have a PhD in psychology, or if you have a master's in journalism or something, you know, a master's in education or architecture, things that really translate to user experience, play that up. But don't say like, I have 37 UX certificates from blah, blah, blah. No one cares about those little certificates, to, in my opinion, um, because they're essentially like, what do they actually mean, right? Okay, industries you've worked in, some of you said, you have experience in B2B or healthcare or finance or whatever types of products. Some of you did this, but let's go deeper. B2B, B2C SaaS, B2B in a certain industry, B2C in a certain industry. Some of you said types of products. So mobile apps, web apps, kiosks, service design stuff. I don't know. Um, you could even think about well-known companies you've worked with or for. It can be useful to include those household name companies that everyone's heard of. It can add some like street cred, so it could be worth it to include those. Um, and languages you speak, that could be interesting. I've had many people include the, um, the detail that they're fluent in like five languages, for example. Someone in Europe uh, was trying to get hired as a user researcher and part of the job was conducting research in different languages. And this person spoke five languages. So they definitely included that awesome detail. Um, and then maybe specific areas of interest or passion, like healthcare, travel, I don't know what. Um, so I want you to brainstorm all of those things really quickly. It doesn't have to be perfect. You can come back to that. But we're going to work some of this in to the sections we're going to get to next. You've probably been doing this while I have been speaking. So I'm curious. Um, let me see. Let's not put this stuff in the chat. I think it's just going to get too cluttered. But do that. And I want to move on to the next part. For those of you that are um switching to ux from a different industry or previous career i want you to think about um how that might transfer to user experience so this is really our chance to connect the dots and identify skills that you might want to shine a spotlight on from your previous teaching career, journalism career, career in architecture. Someone in my career strategy, strategy program was previously an Episcopalian priest and now is doing user research. But they said, you know, in my time being a priest, it was like a lot of research and a lot of like people skills, et cetera, right? knowing you're a customer, learning how to communicate. So we were able to very interestingly, if that's a word, um, take those transferable skills for them and transfer it to research. So if you do come from a previous career or industry, et cetera, 
what are those skills? So for any of you that are a switcher, I'm curious in the chat, tell us what industry you're switching from and what are like one to two different um, skills that you think, wow, I really should shine a spotlight on these two skills from when, uh, from my architecture experience or my teaching experience. So let us know in the chat. And I'm going to give you a second to type it because I know um, it's a lot. So let's see here for the career switchers, because I know we have a few here for sure. So let's see. We need some Jeopardy music or something. <laughs> um, Robert switched from marketing and you think it's pretty normal. Yeah, so marketing, I mean, you could be thinking about, um, did you do any research as a part of your marketing? Were you doing like writing? Were you involved in any visual design? You know, those might be useful, even if you, okay, even if you don't want to do research in the future, it could be valuable to let us know if you did research as a part of your previous marketing career, because even if you don't want to do research in the future, having knowledge of that or being literate in that could help set you apart from other candidates who know nothing about research, right? So Mary said, I studied architecture and environmental studies. Architecture has taught me structure and design principles. Environmental studies taught me presentation and research. I love it, right? Design principles are so timeless, like alignment, grouping, hierarchy, all of these things translate, you know, whether you're designing a page on a website to, you know, arranging furniture in a room or how someone flows through a house and does the kitchen flow to the dining area, flow to the living room, or does it all feel weird? Those design principles are timeless. Exactly, Mary. Okay, Daniel said from project management to product management, I do really well translating stakeholders' requirements into actionable steps and flows. I'm really great at wireframing and ultimately write great documentation. Okay, great. Those are things we're probably going to work into your compass statement. Okay. Um, I was an art teacher before, so it helps me with knowledge of art principles in design. Plus, I learned to involve my social skills and communicating with different people. Excellent. Those soft skills of like talking, presenting, written communication. Those are so timeless and honestly so important because having read or tried to read hundreds, possibly th definitely thousands now of resumes, it is shocking how people really lack the skill to write solid sentences on their resume. And if they can't do it on their resume, it makes me very concerned that if I hire them, what are their emails going to be like? What are their Slack messages going to be right? What will their reports look like? You know, um, so don't um, don't forget those uh, soft skills. Okay, I switched from immigration law. I've been a product designer and user researcher for four years. Law required me to parse a lot of complicated information and quickly tease out the most important things. Distilling complexity is helpful for product design. I love it. Okay, you're definitely going to use some of that in your compass statement. Um, and it's funny, we had an attorney join Career Strategy Lab and we had lengthy discussions about how transferable so many things in law, how many things in law are transferable to user experience, especially research. Okay, Gina said, I work in occupational health and safety as an ergonomist human factors professional focusing on optimizing human well-being and organizational slash system performance. Love it. I see so many occupational therapists or health specialists switching into user experience. And yes, many transferable skills. Okay. Hopefully uh, some of you now see how we can take your previous experience and highlight it. Okay. Jeff said, I'm a, this is the last one I'm going to read. I'm an IT product 
project manager with more than 15 years of experience in Fortune 500 corporations, managing full life cycle of multiple complex technology and engineering projects. Great. Okay. Now, think to yourself, our next little brainstorm is, what are some amazing outcomes, wins, things you could brag about from your current or previous position? Now, if you're just starting out, you can come back and add this you know, in a year. So don't think, oh no, I'm not going to be able to write a compass statement because I don't have these. This is more for people who've been working in UX and have things to brag about or they're proud of. So some examples, um, maybe you increased your product's free trial conversion by 20% through a two-month redesign project. You established, hired, and managed the company's first UX writing team. You created a research toolkit that empowered designers to conduct their own usability testing, which freed up our senior researchers to do higher-level projects. So think to yourself, what are like one to three career highlights that you are super proud of. And as soon as you write one, I would love to see one or two in the chat here from people. We're not gonna be able to read everyone's. So once we see one or two, um, don't bother typing it because we wanna keep moving in the interest of time. But I love that you guys are taking action because like I said, this statement is something that you will be able to use and modify for years to come and put in so many places that you have a really cohesive way that you're communicating your skills and experience. So let's see, anyone have any career highlights that you are most proud of? If not, we will move on. I know this one might be hard to think of. So it's not a requirement for a compass statement by any means at all. So, 10 second countdown here. <laughs> All right, let's skip this one and move on then. So step three, this is very important. What are you looking for? Now, I just zoomed in big time. Okay, what are you looking for in your next role? So do a quick brainstorm. And these are just some prompts. It does not mean you need to answer every single one but it's gonna to be to your advantage to try and get as specific as possible. And of course, you can come back and write V2 of this tomorrow or on the weekend. So think about what do you wanna keep doing, maybe start doing or stop doing in terms of like your job description, your day to day. Maybe you wanna keep doing research and you wanna stop doing visual design. Good, good to know. That's the type of clarity we're looking for. Um, you could also think about what type of company do you want to work at uh, in a certain industry? Do you want to work at a business to business company, a consumer company? Uh, do you want to work at a small company, little startup that has a UX team of one? Do you want to go to a company that has an established user research or user experience department? Um, it's all personal preference here. Size of team is important. If you're a UX team of one, you probably also won't be able to receive a lot of mentorship and stuff. If you want mentorship, you have to go somewhere where you're not the only UX person. So chicken and egg, right? Something to keep in mind here. Um, do you have any specific requirements about you need to be in this city? You're not open to relocation. You only want to work remotely. Get to that level of detail because that's going to help you build a stronger compass statement. And even things like, do you want to work full-time, part-time? You want to be consulting? I don't know. These are all personal things you have to decide for yourself. So I think it's going to be a little busy to put this in the chat, but you're going to end up with a great set of criteria about what you are looking for in the future. Then what we're going to do is put it all together. And again, this is MVP version. So it's really got three sections here. You can see how short this is. Yours might be a little bit longer, but this should not be two pages long, okay? Um, resumes can be longer than two pages. Your compass statement should definitely not be longer than one page. So going back to the goal of the compass statement, right? It's really three sections. 
who you are and what you do. We already wrote this at the very beginning. Then what differentiates you? Well, that's where we were talking about your previous experience, examples of what you've done in the past, any outcomes, wins, accomplishments. And section three is what you are looking for in the future. And that is how you write your compass statement. So you're going to use that as an example. If you keep scrolling, you're going to see a big blank area for you to do it. If you're going to be feeling more comfortable to like use this section one, two, and three format, it's your document. You can copy it and do whatever you want. But um, that is how you are going to write that compass statement. So I want to, um, I was just trying to change a setting there. I want to um, see a couple of examples of your compass statement in action. And don't worry, we know you've only written this in about 20 minutes. So, you know, I'm not going to correct your spelling or anything like that. We all acknowledge this is a prototype, but it would be really awesome to see a few examples in the chat. So let's see who might be ready to share theirs. Um, I would love to see like one or two if possible. I know you guys are probably furiously writing. And then after we read one or two, we are going to get to some Q&A and try and have about seven or eight minutes of Q&A. So who wants to share theirs? Don't be shy. Cue the Jeopardy music. <laughs> I'm sure I could figure out how to play music, but maybe next time. And if you're stuck, you know, don't feel like you're starting from scratch because just scroll back up the document where you already wrote things and you're really just piecing it together. Um, I know it's overwhelming to ask you to do this in, in one shot right now, but let's see. Maybe Mary has one or Gina has one or Daniel might. Let's see, who else was chatty in the chat here? Hannah might. All right, let's find out. <laughs> okay, it's it's fine if it's all bullets. Don't worry. Maybe cut and pasting it's gonna be difficult. <laughs> I was gonna move us into breakout rooms, but I think it's better to do it all as one group because we can all learn a lot from each other and we wouldn't have that many people in breakout rooms anyway. So let's see here, one person. And I guess maybe we could move into Q and A and then if someone has one, well, you can read it later. But look, just as I said that, Mary has one. Okay, I'm gonna read it to everyone. Um, I'm a user experience designer with an educational background in architecture and one year of experience in mobile app design. I have a Google UX design professional certificate from Coursera. I know four languages and I'm fluent in two. I have cross-functional experiences through traveling to different countries throughout my life and doing a foreign exchange student program in Japan for architecture. I studied architecture in environmental studies. Architecture has taught me structure and design principles, while environmental studies taught me presentation and research. In my next role, I'm looking to learn more about good visual design and prototyping skills. I want to work at a tech giant to learn more from senior UX designers. I'm open to working in Vancouver or Los Angeles. I want to work full-time and have freelance work on the side. I would like to work with a big team in order to learn from as many seniors and my fellow juniors as well. This is really great. And I had a little idea. Maybe I will uh, make a, think about this really quick. Um, maybe I will paste it over here um, in this one for now just to 
do a really quick critique. I wasn't planning on this, but why don't we do it? Um, so um, I'm just breaking it up into little paragraphs so I can read it a little more easily. Um, move this up here. Hopefully you guys can see this. Okay, so here we are. Um, this one is Mary's like, what do I do? I'm a user experience designer with an educational background in architecture and one year of experience in mobile app design. If I were critiquing this, I would think to myself, what does educational background in architecture mean? I don't know. Could we just say architecture? Um, maybe. Those are all questions that come to mind. We're not going to be able to go back and forth on this and, and write a full version. But as I'm quickly reading this, that's what I'm thinking. Now, you have a Google UX design professional certificate from Coursera. You know four languages and I'm fluent in two. Um, I might be inclined to remove this. People are going to see this on your resume, on your LinkedIn profile anyway. And it's somewhat a matter of how could we try and make this as short as possible? And that might be one of the things I would consider cutting. So possible cut, but I'm just going to leave it for now. So you have cross-functional experiences through traveling to different countries throughout my life, doing foreign exchange student program in Japan for architecture. Okay. I almost wonder if we could get rid of this whole sentence because, or think to ourselves, what does cross-functional experiences actually mean? Um, and think to yourself, of those cross-functional experiences, what are the ones that might relate to user research? I don't know. Okay, cross-cultural. Okay, so great. So if you want to, maybe, maybe you want to do research and the cross-cultural experiences, you're going to leverage that to show people that through living abroad and connecting with people, you know, in Japan and other places, maybe that's going to make you a better researcher. I don't know. Um, you studied architecture and environmental studies. Okay. If, do you have a bachelor's? Do you have a master's? What is it? I would brag about that. I have a master's in architecture and environmental studies, whatever it is. That's another example of how you could get more specific. Um, okay. Then it's like about architecture and about environmental studies. Um, I like those two calling out the specifics and then in your next role, this is full justified. It just makes it so much easier to read it as left in my mind. Um, okay, in your next role, you wanna learn more about good visual design and prototyping skills. Okay, it's great that you know what you want to learn. I might, I'm gonna put it as gray. I don't know that we necessarily need to include this in the interest in, in in the interest of making your what I'm looking for next be really succinct, um, the employer really wants to know more about like what are you looking for in terms of team, product, industry, et cetera, to make sure that like what you're looking for is what they're all about. So you want to work at a tech giant. I might not necessarily use the word tech giant. Um, because I wonder, you know, there's there's many companies beyond like Fang companies that are large, that have large teams that could be great to work at that you've probably never heard of. So you don't, you may not want to say tech giant because someone that is not a Fang company might think, oh, well, they're not going to work for us, even though we have 30 open roles and like pay amazing salaries or something. So maybe think about, um, and yeah, think about that. You're open to working, you have location, full-time and freelance work on the side. I may not say you want to do freelance work on the side. That could be like a yellow flag and they may think, oh, well, is Mary going to have time to work for us? Is she going to be distracted? Is she going to be multitasking? So um, you want to work full-time with a big team in order to learn from seniors. I love it. So hopefully that little critique, that, that unplanned critique was helpful in giving you ideas of how to be more specific 
But, you know, considering you only just spent 20 minutes doing this, it's a great start. And I think if you were to think about what do you have at the top of your resume right now? What do you have on your LinkedIn about section right now versus what you just wrote? What you were, what you just wrote is probably much more specific than what you have currently on your LinkedIn and um, elsewhere. So I know nothing to be embarrassing, <laughs> embarrassed about Mary. It was great. I think it was a really great start. And like everyone, you only took 20 minutes. So imagine if you took another 20 minutes, how much better it would be, but it's probably drastically better from whatever you have now, or maybe you have nothing like this to begin with. So don't be, be proud of what you just did. Um, Okay, so in I see more coming into the chat and to be sensitive of time, everyone, I don't think we're gonna be able to read them. I know we're right up at our time. So I wanna turn it back over to Mary, not Mary, to Naomi and Dave to see um, if we have any questions, if we have time for questions, I know our workshop went a little long, so I'm going to stop talking for a moment and switch back over to my slides here. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, there was a couple of questions I noted um, just previously, some short ones. We do okay. have uh, two minutes uh, two minutes left <laughs> to the hour. If people right. are keen to stay longer, we could go for a little bit longer. No worries. Okay. We have a time limit. Uh, the two questions that I saw, the first one was, uh, I think it was from Mary, and it was about um, just talk how to talk about your experience, especially as a student, where maybe your work has been more around case studies as part of your coursework. Is it still okay to say that you have uh, a year of experience, even though it, it might be through coursework? And Mary, feel free to correct me if I've misinterpreted the question as well. No, yeah, that was the question. Thank you so much. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So I've worked with a lot of people at all stages of their careers, as, as you all know by now. And a lot of people are in a similar situation where they have not worked in a, you know, quote, formal UX role. Therefore, all of the projects they've worked on are either from their undergrad or grad or boot camp program, or they are kind of self-initiated projects that they they invented, for lack of a better word, because they saw maybe a problem in the world and wanted to try and solve it. So you're trying, you're asking, can you say you have one year experience? Um, and it sounds like if you add up like the time you were studying and working on these case studies, I think that's fine. Like you been studying and practicing UX for one year. I think that's acceptable. Is that what you were asking or did I misunderstand? No, that was what I was asking because I've only okay. been studying for like a little more than a year now. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I think, you know, as you acquire more experience, someone, I forget who it was in the chat, you know, they said, I have four years of experience. So that you know, that part of your compass statement will change over time. But I think if you have one year of experience, put it, but I, maybe other people would kind of argue this differently, but I think saying things like I'm an aspiring UX designer, I'm an upcoming UX designer, I'm a UX designer in training. My stance is like, why not just call yourself a UX designer and let people come to that conclusion through looking at your LinkedIn or res resume, et cetera. Because we know sometimes like in the real world for better or worse, if people see that you are currently enrolled in a program that may, 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 that might make them, you know, pass over your application because they think, oh, this person is in the middle of their training or just graduated two months ago or something. Um, so that's why I'm not a fan of saying aspiring UX designer or something. It's kind of just like, just, you are a UX designer. Some people have 10 experience, some have one. Um, okay. What other question could we answer here, Dave? Uh, there was one, uh, there was, I think 
two to three other ones. The other one was kind of uh, going back to your advice on uh, rewriting each of those resume points. And it was a, it was a bit of a concern around if you expand each one of those, then yeah. the resume goes from one or two pages to four or five pages. And yeah, I, was just, I, I think that was the question from uh, Sajeda. Uh, awesome. So curious about, um, yeah, any, any thoughts you might have on that? Yep. So when you think of your resume, you have to think, you know, there's the, the content, the little, the literal words, and then there's the design as well, right? So there are probably things with the design of your resume that you might be able to do to help it not be four or five pages. Now, those things are not to make the font size like nine points or something. Um, so that's kind of thing number one to think about. But I think sometimes people on their resume, the bullet points under each element in the work history, um, some people put like 10, 11, 12 things. And sure, if you've worked at a company for many years, you will face the challenge that you have to somehow concisely talk about your experience. But I think going back to the roadmap and your compass statement, you can kind of look at your compass statement and think about the job you want to get next and go through those 10 or 12 bullet points under that, you know, part of your job history and think, does each of these bullet points really show off the skills and experience that they are looking for, for the job I applied to. And I bet looking at those 10, we could probably cut some of those um, bullet points. Now, when it comes to that part about tailoring our resume or portfolio or cover letter to every job, but specifically the resume, I do not mean we're gonna rewrite the resume every single time. Tailoring your resume might mean maybe you previously did have like 10 bullet points for each, for one part of your work history, but you think to yourself, you know what, based on this job I'm applying to, because I actually read the job description, it's very clear they're looking for someone with, you know, X, Y, Z experience and skills. So I'm going to look at my 10 possible bullet points and choose the five that match or align with that job description the best. So that's example number one of how you could be tailoring your resume. Number two would be literally reordering those bullet points. So you have five bullet points. Okay, maybe the fifth one is really relevant to the job you're applying to. Put that fifth bullet point as bullet point one. Simple things like that are what I mean by tailoring your resume. You could be even tweaking the little about me or overview sentence, which is part of your compass statement now, at the top of your resume. Let's say you applied to a job in finance to do user research, and you previously worked as an accountant for five years or you know, insurance or something. You might add to your compass statement if it wasn't already there, UX researcher with five years of experience working in, you know, insurance or accounting or accounting for, I don't know, some certain industry. You get the idea. Um, okay. Is there one more we should answer or should we call it? Yeah, there's uh, there's one more. Eva had asked about... Uh, in the interest of getting our product to market, what is kind of an MVP of a portfolio in order mm. to just get something out there as, you know, as quickly, obviously <laughs> paying attention to um, quality and that sort of thing. But yeah, what would be the MVP of a portfolio? Yeah. So I think the and MVP, that out, sorry. yeah, that stands out, you know, if we go back to our slides, which now it's telling me it's time to uh, monitor how much time I've spent on my computer today. But um, I do love that feature. If we went back to this example regarding the resume bullet point where we were, even though this slide was about resume bullet points, um, 
This could also be taxed on someone's portfolio because someone's portfolio could have a slide that says, I was responsible for conducting usability tests at the top of the slide. And then that slide might have screenshots like uh, of auto-generated kind of survey results, you know, in, in survey monkey or other survey tools where you do a survey and then it spits out tag clouds and analysis and all this. A lot of people kind of just dump screenshots of that in their portfolio or screenshots of um, like questions that they asked in a user interview. Or maybe at the top of the portfolio page, it would say responsible for conducting or responsible for creating wireframes. And then below are like a bunch of wireframes and they are not labeled. You have no idea what screen it is, what product it was for, et cetera. So that would be an example of two minimum, <laughs> meaning you're only telling what you did and you're only scratching the surface. So if we were to invent a little checklist of what minimum viable portfolio is, I think it's having a clear statement, you know, about not just what you did, but why you did it, how you did it, what happened. So you didn't just create wireframes, but you created how many wireframes for how many user flows for what part of the product? What software did you use? You know, even mentioning like we created, I don't know, wireframes for the new checkout um, involving, you know, 30 screens, 30 is probably an exaggeration, but 10 screens. Um, and we use Figma, I don't know. But the point is, don't just say literally what you did, go into that detail. And then for the visuals, this is a big mistake people make in their portfolio. They just dump screenshots, but they don't label them. They don't point to different parts of the screen, the, the screen and do annotations. So like putting, you know, this part of this wireframe is intended to do X, Y, and Z. And over here, this part is intended to do this. Little things like that can be really, really powerful. So I know that's a little bit vague because we don't have time to go into all the details of portfolios, but on my YouTube channel and on my um, website, if you just go to careerstrategylab.com slash articles, you will find a ton of articles about resumes, portfolios, et cetera. It's a tremendous resource. And the YouTube is kind of organized into playlists as well that will get you pointed in the right direction also. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, mm -hmm. Sarah. So yeah, if uh, um, Daniel was curious about great examples of portfolios, and so probably you have answered that with uh, your yeah. channel and the articles. Um, so yeah, let's leave it at that. So if people have awesome. some questions, how, how can they, how can they find you? How can they contact you? Yes, we have a slide for that. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we have, uh, on all the different social media, um, I forgot to include my YouTube, but if you just search my name, all my videos will come up Instagram, Twitter website. And then if you're curious about, Career Strategy Lab, where um, we're helping people, you know, at all parts of their job search or proactively be ready for a future job search. Um, you can go to Career Strategy Lab to learn more or see stories from people who might be at your career stage. And then if you're curious, just uh, hit that apply button and because you have to fill out an application to make sure that you are truly at the stage where we can help you. So yeah, that is that's the best way to stay in touch. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. This yeah, was fun. Really appreciated uh, everything. So good. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's end it there. Let's let people go back to their Wednesdays, seeing lots of love in the chat, which is awesome to see. And yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, you sharing, sharing your time with us and your expertise. All right. Thanks, everyone. Great to, great to hang out with you. Awesome. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.